Hi everyone and welcome back to children and young adult literature. So last time in my first lecture I gave an overview of the different types of literature for children and young adults and how those in general matched up with some of their developmental needs. So today we're going to take a closer look at child development ages five to seven and the children's literature that meets the developmental needs of the child and how it also reflects the developmental needs of the child. So to give an overview, we're going to talk about developmental milestones in children five to seven years old. And for all of the lectures about child development, we're really going to focus on, sorry, cognitive, emotional, and social development. So then we'll talk about the needs of early childhood readers, grades, kindergarten through second, um, so that approximate age range. And then we'll examine some of the features of the books written for kids in that age range. This lecture can be paired with the one on Junie B. Jones, a book series written for younger readers featuring a six-year-old protagonist narrator. So I'll have another lecture that's just about that book where I go into a little bit more depth about how to analyze that book and what are some of the things I'd like you to look for as you're reading. Again, um, this is something that I said in the last lecture, just to remind you, development is a continuum. So we're going to here be talking about this in initiative versus guilt stage, this uh, preschooler sort of age, and a little bit into the grade schooler industry versus inferiority. Um, but some children might be a little bit behind. Some children might be a little bit ahead. Um, these are not... You know, they're guidelines, they're not hard and fast rules. The needs of the readers fall in a continuum as well. Now, I went into more de more uh, explanation on this in my last lecture, but just to kind of show you where we're at this particular juncture, <laughs> there's my pen. Um, we're skipping over board books, primers, and picture books for this online class just kind of by default because of the format that we're in and the fact that that's covered a lot by um, another class at our school, which is emerging literacy. So what we're going to do is pick up right here with chapter books. That's where we are this time. And then the next developmental lecture will be talking about lower middle grade. So how children change from five to seven, just kind of in general, um, psychologists say that s children move into what's called the pre-operational, from the pre-operational stage, sorry, to the concrete operational stage during this time. Now, if you haven't taken a child development course, you're probably wondering, what are those terms and do I need to know them? Um, you don't have to memorize them. I just want to kind of introduce, you know, the language that is used by psychologists when they're talking about development. Basically... Here's what this means. Um, a four-year-old, a five-year-old will, will focus on one single aspect of a situation, and they react to that situation based on perception, so how something feels, rather than logic, what might actually be going on. And I'll talk about how we see that in the book that we're reading for this unit. Um, here's an example. Let's say that they're in kindergarten and their teacher says, okay, that's enough coloring. Now we're going to do circle time. Okay. Well, logically, the teacher knows that they have to move from one activity to the other throughout the day, right? They only had 15 minutes. But the child's perception might be, um, I don't want to do that. I feel like coloring longer. How come I can't color? Is the teacher mad at me that she's not allowing me to color? So that's, they're focusing just on their, their, feelings about the situation rather than, oops, sorry, rather than logic. Often they don't understand when others fail to perceive a situation the same way they do. So when I talk here, I'm going to erase all this. There we go. Um, perception. <clears throat> when I talk here about um, self-centeredness, this doesn't necessarily mean, um, the way we think of it in older kids or adults, like, oh, he's so self-centered, he's a jerk. That's not really what it means with children. What it means with children is that they really can only see things from their perspective. They have not developed empathy. They can't really understand 
um, how others might think of a situation. They just see things only from their point of view. So when we have books with a narrator of that age, it becomes interesting, right? Because the point of view is very unique and and centered around um, what they what they feel and what they think. So by ages seven and eight, seven and eight around that time, children realize not everybody's on the same page that they are. There have to be other aspects of a situation that they didn't consider. So you take that same, let's say, preschooler who didn't understand why they had to stop coloring. Um, when that child is in second grade and the teacher says, OK, we've done enough math. Now we're going to do reading. They might just say, oh, that's our schedule. Right. I still like math better. I'd rather do my math problems. But I understand that that's my schedule and the teacher wants to do that now. So they can kind of see things a little bit outside. They'll also understand why someone might be upset um, or why someone might be happy, even if that's not what they're feeling about a situation. In addition, um, by the age of seven, children have a better memory. So one situation relates to another um, that they remember doing or happening or occurring before. Whereas younger children really don't have that great of memory. Um, they will say, um, you know, the last time they were at the store, their mother didn't let them get a toy. This time she's not letting them get a toy. They might not remember, you know, that this happens every time we go to the store, right? Where older children can kind of see those patterns. So in terms of cognition, Children around the age of five to seven start to develop a sense of self-confidence and mastery of their learning. It doesn't mean that they know everything, but it does mean that by second grade, a kid can sit and do work on their own, right? Whereas a, a child who is in preschool really cannot do that. So they develop that um, during that period of time and knowing that they've gotten math problems correct or knowing that they're... Um, reading well. Children this age are learning to read and write so they can sound out simple words most of the time. They're also developing oral language skills, new vocabulary, and sentence structures. Their vocabulary increases a great deal during this period. Um, and we'll talk about how that's reflected in books in a minute. They're beginning beginning to move into that stage where they're not as self-centered and they can see things from other children's perspectives. They can't always see things from an adult's perspective, but if two kids are arguing over a toy um, and the teacher or the parent, let's say, says, well, you know, we told John that it was his turn next and um, then the child might be like, oh, OK, and they'll probably still cry. <laughs> They're really young, but if they're moving into that other perspective, they, they'll learn to share, right? Sharing is kind of a, a sign that they're starting to build empathy. They understand concepts of space, time, dimension. They understand concepts like yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Um, not uh, in-depth, uh, you know, theoretical physics, <laughs> space, time, dimension, but they'll learn how to tell time. Um, they'll know small from large and, and things like that. So how does literature reflect and meet these needs? Um, children start matching words they hear with words on the page. So read aloud books, which may be longer with more complex language, are encouraged. What I mean by that are um, books that might really be for older kids that teachers or parents or guardians or mentors could read aloud to the child. So something like this book over here, the sun did not shine, it was too wet to play, so we sat in the house all that cold, cold, wet day. I think that might be the cat in the hat. Um, that's something that a younger child could read on their own, right? So that's something that is also encouraged. A simple book with short words. Um, we talked last time, I think, about easy readers. That would be another thing that kids could read on their own. But really, if if a child is read to up to the age of eight or nine um, in school and at home, that's one of the number one indicators for success because they're really expanding their vocabulary. And um, even if they can't read those words yet or spell them, <laughs> they can have um, books read aloud to them that are a little bit more complex in terms of language and sometimes in terms of plot too. 
So by the age of five, a child is able to retell a story in order using words or pictures. They can also predict what might happen next in a story using contextual clues. So if you take a three-year-old to see a movie um, and that three-year-old comes back home and you say, oh, now tell me what happened in the movie. They'll say, oh, well, the prince kissed the princess, but then only before that happened, there was a chase. And then before, and then it saw, and then there were also dwarves and then there were also elves. And then also the princess escaped from the dragon. Like it's totally out of order, right? They're just sort of remembering the parts that they liked. If you ask a five or six year old about that same movie, they will say, you know, in order, the princess was trapped by a dragon. Then elves and dwarves tried to help her. Then she was able to escape. She met the prince and then he kissed her at the end, right? It's like boom, 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 one, two, three, four in order. Because of that, they can sometimes predict what might happen next. So if you say, um, Timmy in the story has an ice cream cone. He has money and he goes to buy it, he drops the ice cream cone, they'll be able to tell you what order that should come in, right? He has money, he goes to buy the ice cream cone, he starts to eat it, he drops it. Or if you say, um, Margie has money for ice cream, she goes to the store, what is she going to buy? they'll be able to guess that that's what happened. Context clues are important for vocabulary and language development, so to, for them to guess what's going on in the story um, to, or to understand a word. So that means that they might not understand um, certain vocabulary words, but they can guess what a word means based on the rest of the sentence. So if I say, um, at home I have a lovely garden, they might not know maybe the word lovely, but they could guess that it's describing the garden. Um, it has the word love in there, right? Those kind of things. By age seven, children connect what they're reading with personal experiences. Other books they've read and sometimes even world events as well. So some of those social studies kind of things that they're reading in school. So they'll read a book and they'll connect to a character and they'll say, oh, I know what he feels because I felt that way too. Um, that kind of thing. Since readers are just learning how situations and incidents relate to each other, plots in these are pretty straightforward. And that's something that you'll hear me say in our next lecture as well. Whoops, <laughs> sorry. Um, what I mean by that is there's no flash forwards, there's no flashbacks, there's no symbolism, there's no implied character development. It'll be kind of in your face if someone changes, right? They stop being mean, for example. Um, no subplots. So it's one ca main character going through a situation. Um, there's a problem, there's a complication, there's a resolution, right? Beginning, middle, and end. In terms of structure, books for younger readers are often like a picture book where they have just one storyline. Um, books for ages six or seven, um, sometimes the picture books might be a little bit more, I put complex, but I would say they're longer for the most part structurally, you know, it's still just one storyline. But Later, we have chapter books, and this is a term that I would like you to learn. Um, we're going to talk about this again in the next lecture and with lower middle grade. A lot of books for this age range are episodic, meaning that every chapter is one episode. So they kind of tie together maybe with the same characters, um, but you can have sort of a beginning, middle, and end for each chapter. Now, some chapter books don't because their chapters are so short. You know, they might only be a couple pages. And what it'll do is kind of um, resolve something from the last chapter and then leave you on a cliffhanger so that you want to read the next chapter. So sometimes a, a chapter book, if it's only 5,000 or 6,000 words, will have just one story. Other times, if it's a little bit longer say 10 or 15,000 words, then it'll have kind of like a short story in each chapter of the book. Um, so an adventure 
to be had in chapter one, um, a different adventure in chapter two. Children often learn through play at this time, too. So that's something that I didn't mention with cognitive development previously. But learning through play is extremely important. Um, they're not doing skills and drills at this age. And really, well, I don't think skills and drills really ever work. But children, especially at this age, learn through play. So animal stories, fantasy stories, things that encourage their imagination. Um, here's just an example. Dragons love tacos. Why do dragons love tacos? Maybe it's the smell from the sizzling pan. Maybe it's the crunch of crispy tortillas. Maybe it's a secret. Now, this is a picture book, but you can see here sizzling, crispy perhaps. Those are words, and, and maybe even tacos, depending on what your family um, eats on a regular basis. Those are things that, um, those are words that can help a a child increase their vocabulary and it's a funny book and it's a little bit you know playful and imaginative so learning through play emotional development at ages three or four a kid can sometimes name their feelings so they'll say i feel sad i feel happy um sometimes not so much some of the more subtle things i feel anxious or i feel worried um but they'll know i, I don't feel good is something that they'll say, right? And this is because if a feeling is more complex, they, they can't really completely understand it and they don't have the vocabulary to talk about it. So sometimes they talk about things in physical ways. My, felt, my tummy felt swirly instead of I feel anxious and worried or I have a tummy ache. They'll, they might say something like that. My face got hot instead of I felt angry or they'll, they'll use the word angry for all the different types of anger. So anything from like mild irritation um, all the way up to being completely furious, right? They'll say angry for all of those again because they don't kind of have the vocabulary. Now, somebody six or seven, they might say like, I feel a little bit angry. So they'll start to qualify it. <laughs> the good girl pouting um five to seven they're still learning about the feelings of others as i said before so really at this age they start to look for context clues in people's behavior as well actions gestures facial expressions um listening to a person's words to try to figure out what that person is feeling or trying to say and a lot of times this has to do with what that person feels about them, especially if it's an adult. So um, is mommy angry at me? Does my teacher like me? Right. Those would be some concerns. Um, why is my friend um, making a pouty face? <laughs> why are they upset? Those are some things that um, that they might start to learn. Building an empathy is a really long and slow process. And we'll even talk about empathy more in our next lecture as well. But children are this age, as I said, are self-centered. They lack cognitive and emotional development. So they really can't relate to a person's situation or see things outside of sort of their limited point of view. So it might be difficult for them to see that beyond their own circumstances and recognize the needs of other children as well as adults. What I find interesting about this is if you, if you have, um, sometimes they'll see someone and they'll be like, oh, that person's sad, right? So a parent or, you know, a teacher could be like, well, they're sad because this is the, uh, maybe they, they don't have food, right? Um, so children can be very charitable, right? If you say things like that, they'll go, oh, they don't have food? Well, how come? Or can we give them food? And in that way, they'll be empathetic. But what they have difficulty with is when they are in a situation where they feel strongly, um, they can't empathize with the other person's perspective. So when you have a lot of the schoolyard disagreements, <laughs> um, having trying to get one kid to see the other kid's perspective is kind of difficult. So there are things that people can do to encourage this. Um, and literature is one of them. Books can really help children develop empathy. So we have here <laughs> Alexander in the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. And when you're reading a book aloud to a child, you can say, what do you think that character is feeling? What would you do if you were Alexander? Is there anything he did to make it a bad day? Or it did stuff just kind of go wrong? 
Um, this helps younger children connect with characters and different or diverse points of view to understand them. As I said, that's something really by seven, eight, nine, a child can do. They can connect a character with um, their own life. Naming of feelings can aid children in understanding their feelings. So if I said here, Alexander doesn't really seem angry, but he's kind of grumpy, right? Or he seems kind of annoyed, then you're helping them build that vocabulary. Five to seven-year-olds also derive comfort from routines. So a lot of books, I'm going to underline that if I can hard drawing here with the mouse guys as a lot a lot of books have very predictable patterns so we're going to talk about the Junie B. Jones series and there's something that goes wrong um, with Junie B there's some kind of misunderstanding there's a complication and then with the help of a parent or teacher she kind of figures things out that's a pretty predictable pattern um and this is also one of the reasons if you have kids this age, they will watch a movie over and over and over again, or they'll read a book over and over and over and over again, because they like that predictability. They like what knowing what's going to come next. Um, they like seeing the same pictures that they just saw 10 minutes ago, um, that kind of thing. Social development. So I don't know if you guys have heard this term before, but parallel play is something that really little kids do. Um, up until about the age of five, kids will play next to each other. Um, I watched this the other day in my niece. She is she is four and her her sister is a little bit older. Her sister's 10. So her sister was playing with a friend, another 10-year-old, and they're playing together. And the little one is at the dollhouse with them, but she's kind of like doing her own thing next to them. And it's not because the older kids were excluding her. It's just because a lot of times that's what children do. They will play next to each other, but they don't have as much interaction. By ages five to seven, they really start to develop this more. So this way, I have this picture of these kindergartners. You can see them hugging each other, putting their arms around each other. They'll play games together sometimes, you know, for for gym or for um, uh, outside time or whatever you want to call it, recess. Um, they start to develop social skills. They begin also measuring their performance against others. So by first or second grade, they might you might hear a kid say, oh, well, you know, he, he missed four on the test, but I only missed one right? Or he can kick a ball further than I can kick a ball and I don't like that or I know I can run faster than you can run. So they start to kind of see themselves as becoming um, independent again um, and wanting to do things well. They care about how their peers view and treat them. Not so much like teenagers do, obviously, but this is more like they want to get along, they want to have friends, and they want to have fun. They feel more comfortable spending time without immediate family. So going to school, you're not going to have a second grader who um, has typical development, um, hugging their mother or father when they're being dropped off at school and crying and refusing to get out of the car. You're just not really going to see that, right? You might see that with a kindergartner the first few days or with a preschooler. Um, going to a neighbor's house or being with grandparents, right? They feel kind of okay doing that. Not being totally on their own, but um, being with other adults in that way. They begin to communicate to others without a parent's help. So a lot of times if you ask a, a three or four year old a question, they'll look at their mommy or daddy and they'll want them to talk for them. <laughs> and by the time they're five, six, seven, um, they're, they're able to talk to people outside their family without, without that help. They still feel close, obviously, to their parents, very young children. They rely on them for solving problems and they look to all their adults for help, so principals and teachers. And in literature for this age, um, the, the protagonists are really going to reflect the development of capabilities. So here I've got How to Babysit a Grandpa. Um, it's such a cute book. There's a grandma one as well. This is a picture book, but it's something that a kid this age could read on their own. And it's about like staying with grandma, having grandma and grandpa come and stay with you. Um, 
putting it a little bit empowering of the child, you know, how to be babysit by grandpa wouldn't be as great of a title. Um, the protagonist may be assigned roles and responsibilities in their families and communities. So little things like being a big brother or sister for the first time, making their bed, brushing their teeth, becoming a student. So going to school for the first time, um, making a new friend. All of those things, the, the, the role as a community member, so being a good member of the family, being a good student, starts to become important. Stories focus a lot on family relationships, giving comfort to children about the adults in their lives. So what is interesting is we're going to talk about this. This sort of starts to recede as we go. You're going to see parents a lot more in the early books than you are in the later books, where they're not... Um, as prominent or important. Kids also like reading stories about school and friendships where relationships between children are modeled. So again, trying to build empathy and trying to lead them through how to be a good friend, things like that. They can also see how difficulties are resolved. So using even books that are playful can still have kind of a, a good message for children, right? And if children are read to, even if they're reading on their own, um, but if they're read to saying things like, um, that person wouldn't share toys. What do you think about that? Or they had an argument. What would you have said if you got into an argument with your friend? Um, what did it feel like when you had to go to school for the first time? Were you worried? What do you think it might be like for a new kid in your class? So it's important for them to see how some of those difficulties are resolved so that when they go through some of the same difficulties, they can um, have some of the tools that they need to help do that. So here is, this is an example of a picture book. This is Ivy and Bean. Um, I won't read the whole thing. <laughs> so they're here. They're supposed to be drawing pictures of important people. And he says, Ivy, you can't have a gorilla be one of, oops, one of your important people. Why not? A gorilla isn't a person, said Vanessa. You're supposed to draw people, people in your family. Gorillas are in our family, said Ivy. People and gorillas are related. Yeah, said Bean. Look at Tarzan. <laughs> So here we have an example of, I think they might be here in second grade. So it's a chapter book. You can see that there are pictures along with the text. The pictures kind of help you um, understand what's going on. They're sweeping up glitter. Now she's drawing Abraham Lincoln and a gorilla um, for part of their pictures. And they have kind of a little disagreement. Ivy and Bean are best friends, so you can kind of see them sticking up for each other here a little bit. And then we have Vanessa, who might not be quite a good as good of a friend as them. It might be kind of a naysayer. So a typical school situation and just watching how that gets resolved, right? And again, um, because of the age range, the um, the pictures are also there along with the text. So if they didn't know what the word gorilla kind of meant, they might know it's a monkey or a, they might think of a monkey or an ape rather, even though it's not. Um, it, and then we have the picture here, right? Or if you don't really remember about Abraham Lincoln or what he looks like, there he is with his stovetop hat. So overall, readers age five to seven, they're naturally curious. Children at this age really like to learn. They like to discover new things. They desire books a lot of times, as I just was talking about, with illustrations, especially when the illustrations help give them contextual clues that help to them to discover what a vocabulary word means or to better picture what's going on in the story. They will bond with caregivers through read aloud books that have more complex stories or vocabulary, but they also love the independence of being able to read on their own. So mom or dad reads them a book, um, then they can take a different book and read that on their own before they go to bed maybe, and they feel like they've accomplished something. They feel good about that. They begin to sound out new words, learn about new topics, build vocabulary. They can start telling their own stories in their writing as well. By age seven, they can tell d details in a logical order. 
Um, <laughs> they connect with pre- protagonists their own age, especially with stories they can relate to. And they like stories that encourage imagination and play. So here are some of the um, books for kids this age. I put here Changing Needs because this book right here, the Magic Treehouse book, is really a lower middle grade book, which we'll talk about more later. Um, this book, If the Animal Kiss, If the Animals Kiss Goodnight, is really more for preschoolers. But a child of five years old could read this on their own. Um, the Berenstein Bears and the Golden Rule is a little bit longer picture book, a lot more words than a typical picture book has in that series. So someone could maybe read that to them when they were five, six. By the time they're seven, they seven or eight, they can read it on their own. Green Eggs and Ham is a good example of a book that's a if you can read this right here. It's a beginner book. Um, it's an I can read. So they should be able to read that book on their own. Um, and I like this. You know, a lot of publishers are doing this. They'll mark it with, here we go, reading with help for some kids. Other kids will be able to read this book on their own. Um, Amelia Bedelia books are sometimes chapter books. This one is an I can read book, meaning that it has fewer words. A lot of the times the text is bigger and um, a level one book would be a child can read all of it on their own. A level two book means they might need a little help. A level three book means that it would be read aloud. Same with possibly a level four. So um, those are some things to look for. A lot of variety. And in our next presentation, we're going to focus on the books that I assigned for this unit, um, which is the Junie B. Jones series. So we'll talk about how that series um meets the needs of kids that age and also reflects some of the things that they're going through. Thanks. Have a great day.